Hello, in this report presentation, I'm about to discuss the introduction of the field of human resource development or HRD. So what do we know about this? Well, without more ado, let me dive right into my presentation. Here are the report presentation objectives. First, introduce the field of human resource development in terms of its definition, mission and purposes, and the known evaluation model for HRD. Next, differentiate the human resource development from human resource management. Lastly, provide comprehensive information about the topics that could generate new knowledge through case studies and reasons. Now, human resource development or HRD is the bodies of knowledge and the applied processes used to improve workplace performance and individual learning in organizations with a system focus. Actually, HRD is a central function in any type of organizations, including for profit and non profit organizations, public and education institutions, among many situations, both nationally and internationally. And HRD basically includes training people, provides opportunities for its employee to acquire new skills and allocates resources that can be used to perform the responsibilities and other developmental activities. HRD concept was first introduced by Leonard Nadler in 1969 in a conference in United States. Dr. Nadler was the pioneer in the field of human resource development and a longtime professor at the George Washington University. He died at the age of 95. Now, Dr. Nadler received his doctorate in education from Columbia University and was widely credited with coining the term HRD. Dr. Nadler defined HRD as a learning experience which are organized for a specific time and designed to bring about the possibility of behavioral change. So there is this learning experience. Basically, there will be a course, a program, a learning mechanism that would add value and change you know, to the person who is undergoing that experience. Essentially, you know, the people can understand or do something you know, they couldn't before. According to Khan, HRD is the across of increasing knowledge, capabilities, and positive work attitudes of all people working at all levels in a business undertaking or activities. So there is this increasing knowledge, skills, attitudes. Basically, you know, the process of development is emphasized in HRD. And in the words of Prof. Rao, HRD is a process by which the employees of an organization is helped in a continuous and planned way. So, in HRD, to materialize this concept, there will be sharpening of capabilities that are required to perform various functions associated with their present or expected future roles. So, there will be helping to discover the employee's potential and creating a culture where superior subordinate relationship, teamwork, and collaboration among subunits are strong. Now, HRD is a process and not merely a set of mechanisms and techniques. So when we say process, when we talk about process, we know that there's a certain number of different steps or procedures of getting things done. Since it's a process, we know that each step builds or supports on the others. So the mechanism and techniques such as performance appraisal, counseling, training, and organization development interventions are used 
to initiate, facilitate, and promote this process in a continuous, um, in a developmental way. Because the process has no limit. Now, the mechanism may need to be examined regularly to see whether they are promoting or hindering the process. Organizations can facilitate this process of development by planning for it by allocating organizational resources for the purpose and by exemplifying an HRD philosophy that values human beings and promotes their development. HRM and HRD are both very important concepts of management specifically related to human, resource, human resources of any organization. While HRD and HRM have a lot in common. They also have different roles. In this part of report presentation, I will dive into these and highlight the differences between the two disciplines. First, in the list, HRM is mainly maintenance-oriented, wherein uh, this is likely to be more on actions of the management that help preserve the relationships in an organization, whereas HRD is development-oriented. It's more on gearing upliftment achieving the best possible performance with the org's employees and then reach org's goals. Secondly, in an organization structure, HRM is independent whereas HRD creates a structure which is interdependent and interrelated. Basically, HRD is carrying out specific functions. Thirdly, HRM mainly aims to improve the efficiency of the employees. This means that the management will help the, uh, to manage org's activities with the minimum wastage of resources, which also refers to optimum utilization of resources so that the organization can maximize the profit. Whereas HRD aims at the development of the employees as well as the organization as a whole. Here, there will be process from which the employees learn and improve their skills and knowledge not only to benefit themselves but also their employing organizations. Fourth, HRM motivates the employees by giving them monetary incentives or rewards whereas HRD stresses on motivating people by satisfying higher order needs. So it's like HRM target external factors whereas HRD is more of internal needs. Fifth, people consider HRD not to be a component of HRM. That being said, HRM has a broader focus on labor relations, compensation, benefits, and compliance. HR managers also work on issues like diversity and inclusion. Whereas HRD is primarily concerned with training employees and aligning their personal development goals with the broader goals of the organization. HRD is specifically deals with training and development of the employees. After reading different organizations, HRD mission, generally, the mission is to develop a variety of competencies. These competencies refer to knowledge, attitudes, skills, and technical areas managerial areas, behavioral, conceptual, and human relation areas now that will help the employee to perform several tasks or functions that are expected from the employee or required by the job. In the mission, it includes the idea now, that the employees, now, as they perform the jobs, they could progress, they could go up in the organizational hierarchy. In terms of the purposes, the main purpose of HRD is focused entirely to the development of the employees. But I gathered five purposes that I want to share with you. So let's jump into these purposes. First, 
promote trust and respect in the organization. Second, make people more competent and more committed to their jobs. Of course, this will be aimed if there is this appropriate HRD program. Third, improve the team spirit in the organization. So this will require creating a culture where superior subordinate relationship, teamwork, and collaboration among subunits are strong. Fourth, create an efficiency culture in the organization, which later on leads to greater organizational effectiveness. Key resources are properly utilized and goals are achieved in a better way. Fifth, help to collect useful and objective data on employee. So this involves evaluation. This is one purpose of HRD for, of course, better HR planning. So this is obvious, right? Actually, this is a natural phenomenon that the work is continuously evolving and we experience this now, you know, the massive changes in the work we are doing. The pandemic has caused significant shifts in values that affects individuals, organizations, communities, and nations. These challenges HRD scholars and practitioners to imagine how HRD might create a new normal through bold critical research inquiry that creates humanly sustainable organizations and communities. On HRD evaluation, HRD programs have to be made has to be based on the current and future HRD requirements. Now, the purpose of conducting a proper evaluation proves to have many benefits when implementing any training or learning programs. We want to ensure that we are producing the desired results of that program. But how will we know if we are achieving those goals? A way to ensure you know, that we are measuring the right part of the program is to set up objectives before evaluating. Knowing the objectives of an organization will determine what level of evaluation needs to be conducted. After evaluation, we can see what changes needed to be made in the program or what is working or not. Without evaluation, we will not be able to make improvements in the program. While there are various ways to evaluate the effectiveness of training or learning within an organization, most methods or mechanisms tend to fall into the range of evaluation techniques, making up the Kirkpatrick and Phillips models. The model of Professor Emeritus Donald Kirkpatrick was described in the book Evaluating Training Program that proposes four levels of evaluating a training course. Number one, or the first level, is called reaction. This measures how participants react to the training. It captures the initial or immediate reaction of the participants through short questions or surveys, like are they satisfied or not? happy or unhappy? Did they feel that the training was worth their time? Was the training successful? Did they like the venue and presentation style? Things like that. Number two, or the second level is called learning. This rates whether the objectives, the specific training objectives have been achieved. Number three, or the third level is called behavior. This evaluates whether the training created an impact to the employee or on the employee. So here it will require survey, observation to see whether there is change in behavior at work after a defined interval. And effectively measuring this level, behavior is a longer term process you know, that should take place 
over weeks or months following the initial training. Questions to ask may include did the trainees put any of their learning uh, to use? Are trainees able to teach their new knowledge, skills, or attitudes to other people? Are trainees aware that they've changed their behavior? Things like that. Number four, or the last level, fourth level, is called results. This measures whether the training has a direct impact on the organization's growth. Level 4 will likely be the most costly and time-consuming. The biggest challenge will be to identify which outcomes, benefits, or final results are mostly closely linked to the training and to come up with an effective way to measure these outcomes in the long term. So this Kirkpatrick model is probably the best known model for analyzing and evaluating the results of training and educational programs. It takes into account any style of training, both informal and formal, to determine aptitude based on the four levels criteria, reaction, learning, behavior, and results. At this stage, you will have a lot of metrics to play with and will be more apt at reworking the training course to better cater to company or employee needs. Now, this is where Jock Phillips, the Phillips model, comes in and adds the extra step. Phillips suggests that an efficient training program must come with an unfolding chain of impact. Phillips model ends with ROI or return of investment. Now, but before that, let me tell you some improvements on level 3. In Kirkpatrick model, level 3 is called behavior. In Philips, it is called application and implementation. Now, we learned a moment ago that level 3 of the Kirkpatrick model looks at workplace behavior and assesses whether participants are using what they learn on the job. One of the main criticisms of the Kirkpatrick model has always been that no, it doesn't gather enough data to help improve training. It simply tells you whether the training was put into practice or not. Jack Phillips felt that this level could be improved, so he expanded it no, to cover both application and implementation. Now on level 4, while the fourth level of Kirkpatrick taxonomy focuses purely on results, the Philips ROI model is much broader no? and looks at the impact of the training on the organization or in the organization. This helps identify whether factors other than training were responsible for delivering the outcomes. And the added level ROI, unlike the Kirkpatrick taxonomy that simply measures training results against stakeholder expectations, also called ROE, the Philips ROI model contains a fifth level that is designed to measure ROI, return of investment, or return on investment. This level uses cost-benefit analysis to determine the value of training programs. It helps companies measure whether the money they invested in the training has produced measurable returns and if so, what they are. Now I'll be sharing with you some studies relative to HRD. Let me start with The study of Al Katani and Khan titled An Exploratory Study of Human Resource Development Practices in Telecom Industry in Saudi Arabia, a case study of private sector. That HRD played a very vital role in the success of the industry because it significantly affects 
the performance of the employees directly or indirectly. Actually, the study brings into light you know, the, the fact that the HRD climate in the private sector telecom industry consists of a huge of scope for improvement since the HRD atmosphere was favorable the maximum cooperation of the employees not to achieve the organizational objectives no, was shown no, in this study Madhan and Rohini found in their study titled a study on human resource development practices in Milan exports garments manufacture and exports palani that 54% of the respondents are fully agree that the company has good training welfare and benefit schemes to its employees it also found in the study that 42% of the respondents are satisfied that the company provides good human resource development practices to employees. In the study of Niestani, titled Human Resource Development on Employees Performance and Productivity in Selected Construction Companies in Metro Manila, it revealed that there is a high level of awareness in all 11 given areas of concerns in the field of HRD. Generally, you know, there is a meaningful relationship between HRD and employees' performance and productivity. Last study, Ariola exposed in her study titled Factors Affecting Young Workers' Motivation and Commitment to Stay the context of the Philippine ITBPO industry that ITBPO employees are satisfied with their work as well as other aspects of their well-being because their needs and wants are adequately addressed and provided by their companies no? by being innovative in trainings or in the employee retention programs. In all, HRD is needed by any organization that deserves to be dynamic and growth-oriented or to prosper in a fast-changing situation. Even an organization that has achieved its limit of growth needs to adjust and adapt to the changing world. No organization is immune or exempted to the need for developments that help to acquire and increase its capabilities for the organization's stability and productivity. Organizations can become dynamic and grow uniquely through the efforts and competencies of their human resources. Policies can keep the morale and motivation of the employees high. However, these efforts do not seem to be enough or sufficient to form the organization dynamic and take it in new directions. Employees' capabilities should unendingly be acquired, sharpened, and applied. For this purpose, an enabling organizational culture is necessary. Once employees use their initiative, take risks, experiment, innovate, and make things happen, the organization may be said to possess an enabling culture. And having said that, the HRD is effective and efficient. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you got something useful and whatever it is, you are no better than a moment ago. This is Sir Paul. Till next time.